History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 453rd episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. Oh, yay. We have Kelly (laughs) back. But as you guys could probably tell, we're not in the same location together. We're doing this over Zoom, so the audio may not be as on spot as it usually is. Yes, our apologies regarding that, but I do want to send out a very heartfelt thank you to all the listeners that, you know, have been praying and sending positive vibes with everything that happened with my mother's passing. Certainly appreciate it. Yeah, we definitely do. All right. Well, on this episode, we're going to be talking about a very well-known figure in country music, and that is Hank Williams. We're going to be talking about his life and afterlife. Before we get into talking about Hank Williams, we want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew, Alicia, who spells her name A-L-Y-C-I-A, love that, Sue, Shannon, Dan, and Emily. Thank you for joining us in our Facebook group. And now, this moment, Naughty. Anytime there's a discovery of an ancient preserved creature, it usually garners quite a bit of interest. That was the case when a gold mining family discovered a frozen steppe bison in Fairbanks, Alaska. The bison had been preserved in the permafrost some 50,000 years. Its carcass was covered in a blue chalky substance when it was discovered. The substance was a mineral called vivianite, which turned a vibrant blue when the bison's body's surface contacted the air. Paleontologist Dale Guthrie named the steppe bison Blue Babe, after Paul Bunyan's blue ox named Babe. As the animal was being worked on to preserve the hide for display purposes, Guthrie discovered that the well-preserved neck meat smelled like fresh beef. Dale was a hunter and familiar with preparing and eating frozen meat. He was not fazed by the thought of eating meat that was thousands of years old. So on April 6, 1984, he prepared a meal for a few selected guests. Twelve people dined on Ice Age Step Bison Stew and Wine that evening. The meal was described as delicious, and none of the guests were said to have suffered any ill effects. Enjoying a stew made from unusual meats may not seem strange to those with an exotic palate, but eating a stew made from meat that is 50,000 years old certainly is odd. Peekaboo, I see you. Yeah, you with the little thing sticking in your ears. I'm in your head right now. Those are my fingers in your brain. (laughs) And now, this month in history. In the month of September on the 29th in 2007, the Saffron Revolution came to a culmination. The revolution was brought about by the government when they removed all fuel subsidies without any announcement and allowed the price of oil and gas to skyrocket. As we see today, the rising cost of these fuels also drives up the prices of all commodities. Initially after this price hike, protesters began hitting the streets. However, the campaign garnered new attention when on August 28th, Buddhist monks joined the protest in the city of Sitwe. The monks turned their alms bowls upside down, refusing to accept alms from generals. Meaning, symbolically, they were refusing to give Buddha's blessings to the generals. The Saffron Revolution was named so due to the color of the Buddhist monks' robes. 
That participation of the monks in such a religiously devout nation had great impact. Citizens who'd not been brave enough to protest previously joined the monks in the tens of thousands in protests across the nation. These protests were met with violent military crackdowns resulting in deaths, hundreds of injuries, and arrests. Although the Buddhist monks' demands were not met at that time, the Saffron Revolution was an important movement towards a democratic government. This was achieved in 2015, with Aung San Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy winning general elections, becoming Myanmar's first non-military government in 54 years. Hank Williams was an American musician, songwriter, and singer whose influence has touched some of the greatest singers of our time, from Elvis to Johnny Cash to the Rolling Stones. There was so much promise and talent in this young man, but it was cut short by his struggle with addiction. Perhaps it is that tragic truth that has left his spirit at unrest. Join us as we look at the life, legacy, and spirit of Hank Williams. In 2010, the Pulitzer Prize jury awarded Hank Williams a posthumous special citation, describing him as, quote, a songwriter who expressed universal feelings with poignant simplicity and played a pivotal role in transforming country music into a major musical and cultural force in American life. There are many things about this man that we imagine most people don't know. He came from simple beginnings in a family that knew tragedy all too well. Hank was born Hiram Williams on September 17, 1923. The accounts written on the life of Williams claim that he was named for Hiram, the king of Tyre, which was a city that was located in today's Lebanon. The Bible reveals a narrative in which this king sent building materials and men to help construct the first Hebrew temple in Jerusalem. This may be true, but the name Hiram might also be a tribute to Hiram Abiff. This is a character out of Freemasonry that is credited with being appointed by Solomon as chief architect of that temple. There are several rituals conducted by Freemasons in honor of Hiram Abiff. We're not sure if the King of Tyre and Hiram Abiff were actually the same person and have been combined into one person over the course of history, but their narratives are different, leading us to think that they were different people, and the King of Tyre may be the only one who was actually a real person. Irregardless, Hank's parents were Freemasons. Jesse Lilybell, Lily, and Alonzo Hubble, Lon Williams, were living in Mount Olive, Alabama, when Hank was born. The couple had already had one son who was born in 1921 that died two days after birth and a daughter named Irene who was born in August of 1922. So they had their children back to back. Before the children were born, Lon worked as a railroad engineer for a lumber company and he served during World War I. During that service, he fell from a truck sustaining severe injuries to his head and collarbone. During this early part of Hank's childhood, his parents were strawberry farmers. Over time, Lon's face would become paralyzed, leading Lily to have him hospitalized for seven years in the 1930s, and Hank will only see his father once during that time. These would have been his preteen and teen years. On top of the pain Hank must have carried from not having his father around, he was born with spina bifida occulta, which would cause him lifelong back pain. Lily was left to raise her children alone during the Great Depression. The family moved to Georgiana, Alabama in 1931, and the house they rented there burned down and the family lost everything. Lily was given a second house to live in rent-free by a local man, and this is today the Hank Williams Boyhood Home and Museum. That house was built in 1850 and is a two-story white wood frame house with a wraparound porch, and it sits on stilts. There was a wood-burning stove and running water, but the family had to use an outhouse for a bathroom. Kelly, I know you don't like to uh, share bathrooms, you know, and beds and breakfasts and things like that. Can you imagine (laughs) if you had to share the bathroom as the outhouse? No, definitely not. It would not be my preference. That's for sure. (laughs) I mean, I guess at least in Alabama, you don't have to worry about it being cold. I always think about these poor people who lived up north and had outhouses. How in the world? Yeah, that, that would be a tough one for certain. I did go camping. Well, camping slash staying in a cabin at a location where it was an outhouse. I was always looking for black widows, 
worried that they were going to bite me on my butt. <laughs> That's true. I had thought about that. I've camped out in a place that had like a real, it was an outhouse, wooden and everything. And I hadn't thought yeah. about that. You might get snakes too in Alabama. Yeah, I could. Hank and his sister would help out financially by selling produce from their garden and peanuts. And Hank also shined shoes. No one knows for sure who gave Hank his first guitar, but it was while living at this house when Hank was eight. Many accounts claim it was his mother, and we'd like to believe that was true. And I did read a couple of articles, Kelly, one of which had a lot of his mother's memories. So I don't know if somebody had actually interviewed her or what, but she definitely takes credit for that. And what she did is she didn't have enough money. So she kind of put it on layaway. I don't know what they called it back then. It it might have been layaway back then, too. So she put a little down payment on it and then paid for it over time. And actually, Hank contributed some money towards that, too. So he may have helped buy his first guitar. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I thought so. And I mean, it would make him appreciate it more, too. Absolutely. After receiving the guitar, Hank met a local Black street musician named Rufus T. Tot Payne. Tater Tots? (laughs) It's actually not for Tater Tots, although it seems like it would be. Who led a band, and Hank paid him for guitar lessons, in which he learned chords, chord progressions, and bass turns. He then started playing on the street for tips to help support the family. Singing was natural for Hank. Even before he could talk well, at the age of three, his mother said, he used to stand on the organ stool at Mount Olive Baptist Church and try to sing while I played for the little congregation there. Payne was a huge influence on Hank and gave him his affinity for the blues. It was also in Georgiana where Hank would start drinking alcohol at the age of 10. A little young. Yeah, just a little bit. This, too, may have been influenced by Payne, who was never without his homemade mixture of alcohol and tea. Guess that's probably not a sweet tea. It might have been a sweet tea, but it had some other stuff in there. Ah, gotcha. The nickname Tea Tot referred to teetotaler, which Payne clearly was not. More than likely, this was tongue-in-cheek since his alcohol drink of choice was spiked tea. Yeah, I was like, how did this guy get teetotaler as his <laughs> nickname, I guess, because he was the exact opposite of that or something. But yeah, so it, it had nothing to do with tater tots, Kelly. But now you're making me hungry because it's coming up on lunchtime here. <laughs> I just barely finished breakfast. So sorry. You're on. <laughs> that three hour difference between here and California, you can't get much further unless you went to Alaska or Hawaii. Yeah, this is true. In 1937, Lily moves the family to Montgomery, Alabama and started running a boarding house. Hank started entering talent shows in this bigger city. He won $15 for his first one, which I would think back in 1937 was pretty good money. Yeah, a good chunk of change. And this was with a song that he actually wrote himself. Shortly thereafter, he made the sidewalk in front of WSFA Radio, his stage, and he caught the eye of producers who invited him on air occasionally. In 1940, he formed the group Drifting Cowboys. They performed in clubs and social gatherings. Hank's alcoholism picked up, and he blew a lot of the earnings on alcohol. World War II started, and the band broke up because everyone was drafted except Hank, who was medically disqualified, of course, because he had the spina bifida. Williams was fired from the WSFA radio station because he always showed up drunk. He moved to Oregon to work in the Kaiser shipyard. Eventually, he came back to Alabama to work at the Alabama Dry Dock and Shipbuilding Company in Mobile. Medicine shows were a thing in 1940s Alabama, and Hank started performing in them. It was at one of these shows in 1943 that he met Audrey May Shepard, who was a married 21-year-old mother of a daughter. Shepard told Williams that she wanted to move to Montgomery with him, and they could start a band. He had her come, and in December of 1944, they got married at a filling station near Andalusia, Alabama. So romantical. (laughs) <laughs> Would that be okay with you, Kelly? We just pull up to some filling station and, and get married there right next to the pumps? Um, I think I would have a preference of a different location. <laughs> Actually, though, if it was like a historic location with some of those really cool old pumps, that might be really cool. Well, that's true. You could always use the spigot to hand me the ring. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> there was just one problem, though. Alabama required a 60-day reconciliation period after a divorce, and Audrey was still in that window, so the marriage was declared illegal. It eventually worked out, and the couple would have a son on May 26, 1949, named Randall Hank Williams, or Hank Williams Jr. Shepard worked as Hank's manager and also sang duets with him. 
He began writing songs voraciously during this time and went back to having a show on WSFA radio. So I guess he must have sobered up enough that they were like, okay, we'll let you back in. Try him out again. I would imagine so. In 1946, Williams tried to get on the Grand Old Opry and was rejected. If you can imagine. (laughs) I know. Good grief. They're lost. (laughs) I was just like, oh my gosh, this is Hank Williams. Now, of course, they don't know the future, but still it's like, yikes. It's kind of like saying, no, Elvis, we don't really need you to come over here and, and perform on the Grand Old Opry. Exactly. Shepard suggested they go a different route and found a music publishing company. They found success with A. Cuff Rose Music, and Hank was signed to a six-song contract. This led to Williams recording his first session with Sterling Records. In 1947, he hopped over to MGM Records, and he got his first hit, Move It On Over. Don't we all know that one now? Absolutely. (laughs) This was a massive country hit, but also is considered an early rock and roll song. All through this, Hank continued to drink and ended up being committed to a sanitarium to get him sober. The band was tired of the drunkenness and left Williams. They weren't the only ones done. Audrey was done, too, and asked for a divorce. They wouldn't go through with it, but it was a sure sign of the turbulence in the relationship. Fame would come after the couple moved to Shreveport, Louisiana, and Williams joined the Louisiana Hayride. In 1949, Lovesick Blues became another hit and the Williams moved to Nashville so Hank could join the Grand Old Opry. So they are going to have him back now. With this, the Drifting Cowboys were back again. It was around this time that Hank experimented with another style that entailed Hank reciting religious-themed writings accompanied by a pipe organ. He marketed this material under the pseudonym Luke the Drifter. He did this to protect his image just in case this failed. People figured out who Luke was when he started performing these recitations at his concerts as well. Cold, Cold Heart became another hit on the country charts in 1951, and Williams ended up back in the hospital for detox. In November of that year, he made his first television appearance on the Perry Como show, where he sang Hey, Good Lookin' with Como. Are you singing that to me? Hey, good lookin'. What you got cooking? How about cooking something up with me? Okay. (laughs) Hot diggity. (laughs) I missed you. I haven't seen you in a week. I know. I miss you too. Sorry, I don't look a little bit better. I still have like mascara under my eyes and everything. (laughs) My eyes are all puffy too. It is what it is. (laughs) Yep. That same month, Hank went hunting with his fiddler and he fell aggravating his back issues and leading to a spinal fusion. Hank was only 27 at this time, and now morphine became a problem along with the alcohol. Hank would have another problem. Audrey was really done with the marriage this time, and she told him to get out of the house. The divorce was official on May 29, 1952. Before that, though, Hank had hooked up with a dancer named Bobby Jett, and she would give birth to Hank's daughter, Jett. She would be born five days after Hank's death, and his mother would adopt her and raise her until her death. Hank's sister, Irene, would send this little girl, Jet, into the system, and she wouldn't know that she was Hank's daughter until the 1980s. Can you imagine? Oh, my goodness. And I don't know where her mother, Bobby Jet, was at, because I'm like, why wouldn't she just go back to her mother if her grandmother is now deceased, who was her caretaker. So I'm like, golly, and his sister would just be like, oh, I'm going to throw her to the system. I'm like, that's your niece. After the fling with Bobby, Hank took up with Billie Jean Jones, and they married in October of 1952. Hank had jumped the gun again, though, with this marriage. Billie wasn't divorced. Her divorce wasn't official until 11 days after the marriage. A judge later ruled the marriage was not legal after Audrey and his mother pursued the issue. Williams was already dead at that time. So, I mean, this guy has got a mess when it comes to his relationships, especially at the end of his life here. So I don't think he ever was technically married to Billy. But the problem, too, is what you're dealing with in these southern states is I've never heard of this before. We have like separation and everything that you'll do before you get a divorce. But I've never heard of this. You get a divorce and then there's like 60 days to, I don't know, change your mind. (laughs) I I would think (laughs) you've already gotten the divorce. So changing your mind, it's a little late. Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, but it's just a weird way how they did that. So basically, both of his marriages were considered illegal. And I never read anything that said that it was legal between him and Audrey, but clearly they got that fixed because, I mean, everybody considers that to be his wife and 
I'm sure that his mother and Audrey pursued this whole illegal marriage thing because they didn't want her to inherit anything or have any power over his, you know, music rights and stuff. Sure, I would imagine so. And now a little break for a word about one of our sponsors. Hank was a regular performer still on the Grand Ole Opry. But in August of 1952, he was fired because he was constantly missing shows. And when he did show up, he was drunk. So he went back to the Louisiana Hayride and started touring with them. But his addictions were powerful. His band and friends tried to get him to shows sober, but he often didn't show up or he performed poorly. Even though he was only 29, Hank started having serious heart issues. He did his last recording session with Acuff Rose Music in September of 1952, and this included the song, Your Cheatin' Heart. Your Cheatin' Heart. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be singing a lot this episode. Yeah. Fred Rose cut him loose after that. Hank was touring in Oklahoma when he met Toby Marshall, who was posing as a doctor with a fake diploma. He was actually a convict on parole from Oklahoma State Penitentiary. With the fake title, Marshall prescribed Williams morphine and amphetamines, which made the heart issues worse. Hank performed in his last concert on December 19, 1952. Williams was being driven to Charleston, West Virginia in a North Carolina blue Cadillac convertible with white wall tires and a flying goddess hood ornament when his driver, high school student Charles Carr, stopped in Knoxville, Tennessee to get help from a doctor. Now, you got to wonder, he's got a high school student driving him, but okay. But wow, what a cherry car. And this one is actually in a museum somewhere. It's a very nice looking vehicle. It sounds like it. It's got those big white wall tires. I love, I wish they would make tires like that today because I would totally want those, even though they would look very silly on my Toyota Corolla. (laughs) But I love those tires. I remember as a kid taking the Comet with my dad and and scrubbing them to get them white. (laughs) Williams had combined plural hydrate and alcohol, which had heavily sedated him. A doctor gave him a vitamin B12 shot with morphine and porters at a hotel carried him to the car. I I just, I mean, I know it's the time, but you just imagine, okay, I'm just going to give you a shot of B12. That should help. And why don't I throw a little bit of morphine in there just to put a little cherry on top? Good grief. Carr and Williams continued their trip and arrived in Bristol, Virginia around midnight on January 1st, 1953. Carr stopped at a diner and asked if Hank wanted anything, and he said he didn't. And that would be the last thing he said. Apparently, Carr didn't realize that Hank had died until he stopped at a gas station in Oak Hill, West Virginia, and noticed that Hank's body, curled beneath a navy blue overcoat in the back seat, wasn't stirring at all. Rigor mortis had already set in, and the police were called. The coroner did. Can you imagine? He's like been dead in the back of the car, and the kid has no idea. Ay, ay, ay. The coroner did an autopsy and found hemorrhaging in Hank's neck and heart and some injuries that looked like he'd been in a fight recently, including a welt on his head. I don't know what any of that means, if he really had been in a fight recently, if he'd fallen down when he was drunk at some point or what. But the death was ruled as heart failure. Hank was transported to Montgomery and buried in a silver casket at the Oakwood Annex in Montgomery. Hank Williams Jr. had his father's grave rebuilt after his mother, Audrey, passed away, and he had her interred next to his father. The monument is made from Vermont granite and has carvings of Hank's boots and guitar and his greatest hits, and also has a sculptured hat. It's a very cool-looking memorial. If any of you guys have been to it, we'd love to hear about your impressions of that. Williams' fame skyrocketed after his death, and his image and music were in heavy demand. He would go on to be declared the king of country music. He'd been signed to start making motion pictures, but obviously he didn't live for that to happen. A movie about his life starring George Hamilton, Your Cheatin' Heart, came out in 1964. Hank would receive a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame and was inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. The Williams family carried on the music tradition with every generation having musicians, and Hank's final contribution to music was completed in 2011 with the release of the album The Lost Notebooks of Hank Williams. There were unfinished lyrics with Hank in the backseat of the car when he died. These were later found. Wow. It's, this is a crazy story. Yeah. These were later found in a dumpster by a janitor at Sony ATV Music Publishing in 2006. She sold them to the Honky Tonk Hall of Fame and the Rock and Roll Roadshow, but was later accused of theft. 
A judge sided with her, but the lyrics were returned to Sony ATV, and they asked Bob Dylan to complete an album with them. Artists who recorded for the album included Alan Jackson, Nora Jones, Jack White, Lucinda Williams, Vince Gill, Rodney Crowell, Patti Loveless, LaVon Helm, Jacob Dylan, Cheryl Crow, and Merle Haggard. Now you have to ask, who was the employee that threw those into the dumpster? Right? I mean, that's insane. And then I also have to wonder, why is the janitor going through the dumpster looking at stuff unless she did that on a regular basis to be like, what kind of good stuff is in here? Well, yeah, that's a possibility. And how they figured out what was what. But apparently a judge said, nope, she found them, but we're going to go ahead and give them back to Sony. So I guess everybody got something in the in the end there. But that hasn't been the end for Hank Williams. His spirit still seems to be here in the afterlife. One of Williams' favorite cities was Nashville, and that makes sense since this is basically like country's capital. The Ryman Auditorium is a place where every great act from country is played at one point. This location is a favorite haunt of Patsy Cline, and we discussed that in her episode, and it is for Hank as well. An employee claims to have seen Williams materialize in a white mist. She saw the white mist on stage, and as she continued to get closer to it, it started to take a more defined shape, and when she got as close as she dared... She could see the unmistakable, thin, lanky form of Williams leaning over a microphone as though he were singing. A construction worker also claimed to see a white, misty, thin form during renovations in the 1990s. Hank's spirit wanders all over the Ryman, been seen in hallways, on the stage, and backstage. And I've been outside of the Ryman, but I've never been inside. So one of these days when you and I make our way to Nashville, I definitely want to take a tour of that. Sounds like a plan. Songwriter Gary Gentry had an interesting tale about the spirit of Hank. Gentry was working with J.B. Detterline on a Hank Williams tribute film in 1982 called The Ride. The men decided to write a song as a tribute to Hank Williams and Lefty Frizzle, and they called it Wherever Hank and Lefty Are, That's Where I Want to Go. (laughs) I guess that's pretty basic. I guess so. (laughs) Gentry went home and felt restless. He was living a life similar to Hank doing drugs, and drinking a lot, and he felt like the song didn't do justice to the country legend. He decided to conduct a seance to contact Hank. He said, I wanted to write a masterpiece about Hank, and I was mad, and I was drunk. So I said, Hank, why were you so big? Just because you died young? Show yourself. Help me write this song. And (laughs) And according to Gentry, he did. Hank appeared sitting on the couch without a shirt on, and Gentry said, Hank, we're going to take a ride. I want to write about you. I think you're the greatest songwriter and entertainer that ever lived. Gentry hopped into his car at 4 a.m. and drove around. When he got home, he called J.B. Detterline, and they completed the song. David Allen Coe eventually recorded the song, now called The Ride, and released it as a single in 1983. Shortly after that, Gentry performed the song at the Grand Ole Opry House for a television show. And when he got to the word Hank, In the big payoff line, the lights and electricity went out at the Ryman and also at the entire Opryland complex. So maybe Hank wasn't too pleased with it? (laughs) Yeah, I don't know if he was saying he wasn't pleased or he's like, hey, they're saying my name. Boom. I'm going to get everybody's attention. It's me. I'm here. Yep, could be. It's quite the thing to hit Ryman and the entire Opryland complex. The last place Hank performed publicly before his death was the Elite Lounge Casino Cafe in Montgomery. This place eventually became a restaurant known as Nobles. And now, based on what I was researching, Kelly, I think it's called Club 5050. If somebody lives in Montgomery and knows, you know, correct us on that. The location has been haunted for decades, and Williams is believed to be one of the spirits here. People claim to see a man in a suit, and that's what they've nicknamed him, the man in the suit. Hank always wore a suit on stage. The spirit is feisty like Hank and likes to rap on tables, making loud noises. Tables and chairs have even been witnessed moving on their own. Another Montgomery haunt for Hank is his gravesite at Oakwood Cemetery. Alan Jackson's song, Midnight in Montgomery, is about his experience of visiting William's grave on New Year's Eve before a show and having the spirit appear and thank him for his tribute. I've heard that song a million times, and I guess I never really thought about what he was singing in the song. Now I want to listen to it again because I'm like, my gosh, he's singing about talking to the ghost. Yeah, it's always interesting when you find more information on songs and you haven't really you know, concentrated on what the lyrics were saying. Now I need to re-listen as well. 
a miss like the one seen at the Ryman is seen here as well. And people sometimes hear a Hank Williams tune in the air, especially if they start off singing a song and then stop. It's almost like they're singing with him and he continues on. Williams also played on the streets near City Hall, and some people claim to see a spirit down by the building occasionally as well. The Andrew Johnson Hotel in Knoxville was a place that Williams stayed on his road trip to death. This was once the tallest building in the city and is today government offices. The spirit that haunts this building is very fast, so it's hard for witnesses to be sure that it belongs to Hank. But singing tends to accompany his ghost, and it sounds a lot like Williams. There was also a sighting of Williams in Oak Hill, West Virginia. A man was walking past the gas station where he was found dead and the old Tyree funeral home where the body was taken and he heard music on the air. He then saw a thin figure standing on the street who was wearing a white suit and a cowboy hat. The figure was puffing on a cigarette and tipped his hat at the witness. There was no doubt to the man that this was Hank Williams. The minute he realized that, the figure disappeared. So clearly it was intelligent. Yeah, that noticed him. And I love that he's in a white suit. Is that what he got when he got to heaven or (laughs) perhaps Matt Swain in his book ghosts of country music shares a story that was shared with psychic medium Mary Lynn Stevenson by a family from Mississippi the story is set in autumn and the daughter Deborah is headed to the high school homecoming dance she was carpooling all of her friends and the group of girls had a great time Deborah dropped everyone off after the dance and headed home she ended up on an unfamiliar road and was soon lost Keep in mind, this is probably not where you have cell phones that you can bring up your Google Maps and figure out where you're at. Sure. Her gas was running low and she didn't have much when she spotted a store over the hill. And the other reason why I know there probably was no cell phone involved here is not only did she not have one on her, but she tries the payphone, but it didn't work. There are some listeners who probably don't even know what a payphone looks like. Oh my God, you're dating us. <laughs> <laughs> she drove further on to a gas station with another dead payphone. Deborah fumbled with the paper in her pocket to see how much money she had for gas and discovered she actually had no money. She started to weep in the car. Before long, a man in a brown suit with gold stitching and sporting a cowboy hat walked up to her car. He asked, what's wrong, little lady? Can you just see a little cowboy sauntering over? I know. <laughs> yeah, help you, little lady. She told him her troubles, and he gave her money for gas and phone calls and told her to go straight home. Deborah decided to go into the store to thank the man and get directions. No employees knew what she was talking about. They hadn't seen any cowboy. Deborah did make it home, and her mom asked how things had gone. Deborah said fine at first, but then told her mom of her troubles. Her mother revealed that she had a premonition, and it made her very concerned. So she prayed that a guardian angel would be sent to help Deborah. Both women decided that the cowboy was the guardian angel. A few days later, they were both in a store and flipping through a magazine. When the page opened to a certain page, Deborah called out, that's the man who helped me. Deborah's mother looked at the name in the caption, and it was Hank Williams. She told Deborah that wasn't possible, but Deborah was absolutely positive that Hank Williams had been her guardian angel. Isn't that the coolest story? I was just going to say, that is so cool. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, hey, I mean, if you got to be helped by somebody, why not Hank Williams? Heck yeah. Hank Williams lived a big life in a very short amount of time. His legacy has spanned decades. Has his spirit continued on in this plane of existence? Are these places haunted by Hank Williams? That is for you to decide. Well, uh, gives us another reason to head on into Tennessee and uh, definitely... I've wanted to go to uh, Nashville with you and spend a little bit more time there too. I was only there for an overnight, so I didn't get to. Absolutely. We need to do it. Yeah. So we'll make that a date for sure. We'd love to have you guys check out our website at historyghostbump.com. And if you'd like to send us some feedback, you can do that at historyghostbump at gmail.com. I did want to share that uh, Dewey had posted in the Spooktacular crew. Ed Jones is one of our listeners and also an executive producer, and he's in Las Vegas. So he was asking people about going to see Zach Baggins Museum there because he wants to have a creepy experience. And Dewey was telling him that there were a couple other museums that he actually had had some experiences in. And he said, Ed Jones, we enjoyed the Mob Museum. It's near the Fremont Experience. We felt a presence at the chair for the state's gas chamber. It has a picture of the first convict they ever used it on. My wife said she felt him following her afterwards. I only felt him at the chair. There's always a glass case with the hitman's and a mob boss's suits inside. 
We both bent down to read the sign in front of the hitman's, and I felt as if I was pissing off the wrong person. But once I stood, it stopped. The Clark County Museum, we spent four hours there. We felt heavy presences and heard sounds in the jail, blacksmiths, train station, and caboose cart, along with the vintage homes in the main street sector. Virtual trick-or-treat going strong in the Spooktacular crew. If you want to be a part of that, you need to join us over there so that you can get all set up for that before the 1st of October, which is when that closes and you won't be able to get a victim anymore. And I've already seen people are going back and forth and the group that we have set up for that. Looks like a lot of fun. I want to thank you guys for tuning into this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We want to thank Suzanne Silk for again raising her contribution. She's working her way into a mausoleum. I just know it's going to happen. And also Rita Whittington has raised hers and she will be moved into a chest tomb. Thank you so much for supporting History Goes Bump. We really couldn't do this show without you guys. Sweet dreams. the guitar, Hank met a local Black Street music. I can't say musician. <laughs> I have a hard time with it too. <laughs> me, 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 me. There's just one problem though. Alabama required a 60 day reconciliation period. Oh, I'm sorry, you're supposed to be reading. <laughs> I'm like, what is she doing? <laughs> I'm like, this is my paragraph, damn it. <laughs> fight, fight. <laughs> He did his last recording session with Acuff Rose Music in seven in seventeen seventy September. <laughs> seventeen <laughs> September. Yeah. He decided to conduct a séance to contact <laughs> Jesus. He decided no, to. I don't think I don't think <laughs> Jesus had anything to do with that séance. <laughs> Even though he was only twenty nine, Harks Hark. <laughs> <laughs> Their old angels sing. <laughs>